Rahim, Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecmain. Uh, Hakan, did you start uh, recording? Yes, I, I start. Okay. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome again to Nursi Society webinar uh, meetings. Today we have with us Dr. Tuğba Nur Yeşilhark Özkan from Durham and she will be talking on the problem of evil, what is created when Sher happens. We listened to her before, just uh, a summary of this, uh, uh, this talk. Uh, she, I think, uh, her PhD thesis is uh, on, on this topic. The uh, main issue is Ustaz Nursi, if you read, says that the creation of Sher is not Sher. The creation of evil is not evil. It's the committing of evil is evil. When human beings commit something, can I just can I can I just interrupt? There's a lot of background noise. Could we please ask everyone to put their mics on mute? That's what Okay, please. Everybody, turn off. When when you ask questions, you can turn on your uh, microphone. So uh, I think uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Tubanur. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Alperson Hajam. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, um, today we'll talk about uh, the problem of evil and the topic that I have chosen is what is created when Shar happens. Um, it is a little bit of a tricky topic and it is a bit difficult to explain, but I will do my best um, uh, to, to explain it. Now, um, this, these are the things that we are going to talk about today. Uh, the points of discussions are a uh, brief introduction after that, the definition of evil slash shar, um, the principles of khair and shar in the Risali Nur, uh, and um, I think the principles are scattered throughout the Risali Nur, those principles on Khair and Sher, and it makes uh, sense to bring them all together, to gather them, and then to um, talk about this topic uh, in the light of those principles, which makes it a bit easier and makes a bit more structured when we want to um, understand what the Risali Nur has to say on uh, Khair, particularly also on Sher. And then also I have asked a reverse question um, to uh, what is uh, what what's you know uh, what is uh, uh, created when shar happens to this question I, I, I've I've created a reverse question to that um, just to uh, um, you know lead to uh, another another topic on top of that topic basically inshallah so when we have enough time we will go into that one as well now um, what i want to maybe also clarify before we start is that i'm not going to talk about the odyssey today so i'm not going to defend god um in regards to uh you know why does he allow share to happen if he's so compassionate and if he's all wise why do we have share in this world so this this whole uh, presentation is not going to be around this topic um we will solely concentrate on uh, the ontological aspect of Sher, um, you know, on the uh, wujudi slash ademi aspect of Sher, you know, does it exist, does it not exist, what's the quiddity of Sher, and so on and so forth. So we will more look into that aspect uh, rather than uh, rather than looking into uh, the theodicy aspect of it, basically. So as an introduction, I've given a few, uh, a few uh, terms here. So what, one of them will be, as I said before, um, what do we mean when we talk about Sher? And what is it uh, that is described as evil in literature uh, compared to that? And also, um, what is, is our understanding of Sher the same as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's understanding? Thank you very much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's understanding of uh, shar in the Quran. So that means is the Quranic definition of shar 
the same as our understanding and what we understand when we say share. Um, th this is very important to, to know when we want to proceed uh, and go, you know, and understand the ontological structure um, of share simply because, you know, if, if our understanding is completely different from that of the Quranic perspective of, of, of what Allah, uh, you know, tells us what share is, then we are starting off at, at the wrong footing and everything else is basically, you know, um, uh, a discussion that is for no prevail really. So, and then there is the presumption in many of the literatures that share exists, that evil exists. So there another presumption and everything, all the discussions uh, are based on that presumption that evil exists. Why? Because it is real. Why? Because we can feel it. There is pain, there is grief, there is death, there is depression. And all of these are, seem to be signs of, of share of some sort of evil. So what do we do with that? So we presume that, that it exists and all the discussions are based or built up on that presumption basically. So we, we are going to touch on all of these topics, inshallah. Now let's go into the definitions straight away. Um, I will very broadly, very broadly. Um, give a very brief explanation of evil, what, what evil is. And evil is in literature, evil is mainly, um, uh, mainly uh, 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 divided into two main areas. One of them is natural evil and the other one is moral evil. Now, when we talk about natural evil, natural evil mainly uh, are all sorts of evils are described as all sorts of evil where there is no human intervention. So we could say in, you know, all, all those uh, natural disasters, calamities that we can think of uh, that uh, have this, some sort of destruction uh, at its result, but there is no human interaction in it. So these are called natural evils. And then the other uh, aspect of evil is moral evil, uh, described in the literature as evils afflicted by human beings onto creation and large. Uh, so here we've got the moral aspect of it. And um, and human beings are being taken into account uh, or be, you know, they, they are being asked to answer um, in the face of moral evil, simply because uh, you know, there is someone guilty out there that you can you know, point to basically. Um, so very broadly speaking, obviously these are, you know, that in literature, this goes much more into detail, but very briefly due to the, the you know, short period of time that we have. Now, when we go into share, um, and we look into the semantic analysis of the term share in the Quran, we can see that one of the, uh, one of the descriptions of share in the Quran is, for example, uh, parsimony, bakhala, which, which is extreme stinginess. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns uh, from, being sting, uh, from being stingy, from withholding what Allah has given us uh, from his grace. And he also states in the Quran that he, whoever uh, is stingy, um, in fact, uh, wrongs his own soul because Allah is the possessor of everything. So, you know, whoever is, does this, uh, in fact, uh, harms himself and no one else. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, word is going astray. The next uh, defining word is going astray, dalala leaving the right path, Surat al-Mustaqim, which is quite self-explanatory, uh, but we will touch upon that uh, later on uh, as well. The next one, for example, is Kufr, rejecting God, which has three different, uh, according to my understanding, three different meanings uh, when it's mentioned in the Quran. One of them is to choose not to believe in God. Uh, the other one is to cover up the truth. And the third one would be to be ungrateful to all the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Um, and uh, another uh, descriptive word is adultery, shirk, to worship things alongside God. And obviously when, when, Allah, when the Quran talks about shirk, it does not talk about uh, idols in the sense that we see, we've seen at the time of Hazrat Ibrahim, you know, where you've got those you know, those built uh, idols in front of you. But nowadays, when we talk about shirk, when we talk about adultery, it can be all sort of things, um, 
like, you know, money, husband, kids, a house, car, handy, you know, all sorts of things that we are so much attached to that it uh, veils uh, us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the next is a violation of a covenant or treaty. Uh, the root words for that is naqada, um, not to keep one's promise to God or to an, any other fellow uh, beings. This which is also uh, defined in the Quran as uh, being shar. Another one is, for example, aversion, arada, to turn oneself away from God or to dislike, even to dislike God. Another one is slander, which is mentioned in the Quran in relation to um, Hazrat uh, Aisha and uh, the, uh, the, the defamation um, of her situation, the slander that has been made at that time, and ifk, uh, which is also described as a very sharp thing to do um, in the Quran. And uh, the, the last one that I could, could find is uh, tari, transgression, to exceed all bounds in wickedness or to be excessively impious and insolent. Now, if you look into all of these uh, descriptive words uh, in the Quran that define shar, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines um, shar in his own understanding, then we can see that all of these attributes uh, have, first of all, they have no external existence. Yeah? So they're not tangible, they're not touchable, they have no external existence. And the second thing is that they illustrate a um, diverted relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these attributes. Um, so there is almost, uh, they also demonstrate a withdrawal from being um, or from the good, and as such they are a fall from being into So these, these terms are very important in mind because they will, they will come up later on in, in our uh, presentation uh, more often. So they are, uh, it is basically a fall from being into non-being, from goodness into, into uh, uh, shar, uh, evil, if you want to say so. And um, so from that fall, from that fall from being to non-being, or from that fall from good uh, into, uh, from good into bad, basically, if you want to say so, what comes up is also from the Quranic definition of, when you look into the Quran, we can see terms like loss of God's grace, or loss of uh, guidance, loss of uh, understanding, loss of God's resignation, loss of patience, loss of faith, or in another verse we can see even ultimately even loss of hope. Now, these uh, terms that are also mentioned in the Quran basically show us that, um, you know, these, all of these attributes when they are being kept done, you know, it is some, some sort of a loss uh, in, in a sense. So that's what we mean also by when we say it is a, um, uh, a fall from being to, to, to non-being or to non-existence. Now, that throws up the question then, is evil uh, limited or is it unlimited? Uh, in a sense. Now, here, here uh, you know, looking at these things, we can say that it is limited and it ends um, with the death of the spoiled will of uh, intelligent being. And we will go into that a little bit more when we talk about, uh, when we talk about free will uh, and what the, what, what evil, what evil, ro the role evil plays in, in, in choosing and in free will. But it is limited, you know, and it ends with the death of basically of that uh, spoiled will of, uh, of creative intelligence or with the death of uh, that human being altogether, obviously. Okay, now let's go into uh, the principles of Khair and Shar in the Risali Nur that is scattered in the Risali Nur. Now, um, the first principle is, says, any existence or vijud requires an existing cause. So that means for something to exist, all of the causes need to uh, gather, need to be there for something to be able to come into existence. Um, for non-existence uh, to, have, um, to have accidental existence for non-existence, um, one of the causes needs to be spoiled. 
um, needs to be lacking or needs to uh, not be there basically or needs to be left out. Now, um, an example that we can give, which is very famous, is for example, for a flower uh, to be able to grow, there needs to be water, there needs to be uh, soil, there needs to be air, so all the causes, you know, minerals and so on and so forth. So all the causes need to gather in order for the, for the flower to exist. Um, but for example, if you talk about uh, a car, we cannot say that, oh, so an entity that has four wheels, that has uh, a steering wheel, that has, you know, all the, the, the outside and everything, but is missing an engine, for example, we cannot really call that car a car because the purpose of a car is to take you from point A to, to a point B. And it, if it doesn't have, if it's lacking an engine, then you can't really talk of a car in that sense. So it basically goes into non-existence. You know, it's, it's, it does, it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense talking about a car when there's no engine. So the, the second example is there is no absolute non-existence. Adam, I know that. that's also what is mentioned in uh, the response. What we mean by there is no absolute non-existence is that everything that exists comes from uh, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from Amy Ilahi. It, uh, and, and when Allah decides uh, for it uh, to be created, it will come into the Alim Shahada, and then afterwards it will return back into Ilmi Ilahi, which is the knowledge of Allah. So from that perspective, uh, in the Risali Nur, uh, Imam Nursi says, there is no absolute non-existence. Everything uh, the third principle is existence is pure good, wujud khair al mahd. Non existence is pure shar, adam shar al mahs. So, this I think Imam Nursi has borrowed from uh, Ibn Sina, uh, who has stated uh, exactly this, uh, this sentence, which where he relates everything that is good with existence and everything that is shar with non existence. Uh, the fourth principle is shar is non existential in nature and arises from non existence. Now, shar is non-existential in nature and arises from non-existence is related to um, the, the, uh, the point any existence requires an existing cause. Now, how can we explain this, this the fact that shar is non-existential in nature and arises from non-existence? If you go back, if you go to this slide, it, may, it makes it a little, a little bit clearer maybe. So any existence that we see takes substance by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it comes from non-existence. And again, when we say non-existence, we don't mean absolute non-existence. It comes from non-existence and it takes substance by the power of God, and then it is created. Now, when we talk about share or the unit of measurement, as a unit of measurement and as an accidental existence, that share does not come from non-existence. It comes, well, it comes, it is, uh, it arises from, non-being or the absence of a cause which is embedded in existence so it takes its substance from non-being by the privation of substance so it is actually if you want to say so it is like a uh, like a parasite like a part of of existence itself um, therefore we can say that it can be attributed to uh, creation it can be attributed to human beings as well, uh, rather than directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next principle says, there is no absolute shar, shar al-mutlaq in the universe. Now, this is uh, kind of obvious in a sense, because when we say that shar is non-existence, uh, and we say that there is no absolute non-existence uh, in the universe, then we can also derive from that that there is no absolute shar in the universe either. Uh, in fact, Imam Nursi says that uh, good, uh, goodness prevails always and is abundant in the universe and that share is only minor. But we will talk about that as well. So the next principle is to abandon a minor share can lead to greater share. 
So what do we understand from this? In, an, in a different uh, place in the Risali Nur, Imam Nursi says, in the view of wisdom, if the lesser evil encounters the greater evil, the lesser evil becomes a relative good. Um, so, you know, the example is given here also by Imam Nursi about the a finger that is cangreen that needs to be cut off. If it's not being cut off, then the hand or the arm will have to suffer from it. So it is always um, better to get rid of the finger uh, forefront in order to prevent greater harm, in a sense. So, um, uh, so it is, it is related to the higher good defense, basically, uh, this principle. Um, yeah, but then again, we can, we can ask here the question, so what is it then? Does, does Nursi state that there is existence, uh, that, that evil exists, in fact, that we say that in, uh, when he says that there is lesser evil and greater evil, what does that exactly mean? Does that mean that evil exists? Uh, does he, has he changed his mind in the Rusani Nur? No, he hasn't. What he's trying to say is he's just trying to make it understandable for the people because it's a very tricky topic anyway. So what he's trying to say is there is levels of goodness in there. So with the intervention of the apparent evil as a unit of measurement, basically, we can see the levels, the different levels of uh, khair, of goodness, basically. That's, that's how they come, come to be or come to existence. So the next principle is share has some sort of external reality or minor existence. Share has some sort of external reality or minor existence. Now, um, here again, as we said before, that what, what Nursi means by this is it has some sort of external reality. He does not say it has some sort of external existence. He says it has some sort of external reality. It is, as we said, as a unit of measurement. So it is, Shar basically, um, uh, serves as a unit of measurement and it contributes to the development of innumerable abilities and potentialities in human nature and in all creation. So um, in that sense, looking at it from that perspective, and this brings us basically to the next two principles, which is completely connected and directly connected uh, to the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, which is uh, uh, one of them is Ashrar are the manifestation of divine majesty and as such require a certain reality. Uh, and the other one, you know, for manifestation, and the other one is all good things are the manifestation of divine beauty and as such originate from God. Now, um, how do we have to understand these? Um, Dursi says that all good things originate and are caused by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ashrar uh, originate from God, but they are not caused by God. Why? Because they are caused by the mayalan, by the, 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 the mal intention of human beings, which again we will talk about in a minute. Um, but there are certain realities, but there are certain realities for the manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, divine majesty. Uh, yeah, I mean, if there's questions about that, I will go into that a little bit more in detail, maybe. For now, I think it will suffice if I leave it here. So the next principle is the creation of share is not share, rather the desire for share is share. Now here, this goes completely into free will, yeah? Um, so uh, basically what it says is uh, that, uh, let's go into, oh, I cannot, oh, there we go, okay. Let me put this to the side, okay. So when we say the creation of share is not share, rather the desire for share is share. What we're saying basically is that share is neither absolute non-existence nor the true form of a being that has been brought forth by the will of God. It is a unit of measurement depend, dependent on the inclination, on the male land prior to free choice. 
So he who, you, he mis, who misuses uh, his free choice due to evil inclination, wrongs his own nafs, for Sher is like an intestinal parasite that the nafs nourishes within itself to its own destruction. So this basically goes uh, in line with, you know, whoever misuses that that has been given to him um, with uh, wrong inclinations, with uh, inclining towards things that Allah dislikes, he's basically uh, wronging his own nafs uh, by doing so. The next one is free will has no actual existence. It is like a unit of measurement. So here we, we have the definition of free will uh, as a principle as well, or the quiddity, which is qu quite similar to that of evil. Uh, free will also has no actual existence. And it also is like a unit of measurement. It is there at the moment when we have to choose something and it disappears again when there's nothing to choose basically. And then the last principle is destruction is easy. And this relates obviously to uh, any work that is carried out by man uh, is not through any power or ability. You know, when we talk about evil things, obviously, uh, these are not carried out by man through any uh, power or ability. The power lies in neglection and abstaining from action. In other words, in non-existence. So what we, what, you know, what, Basically, an example that is mostly given for this one is, uh, you know, um, being able to uh, destroy a, a whole house by just one uh, match, which is very easy. But making it or rebuilding that house uh, is is very difficult. Now, um, how much time do I do I have left? Almost 20 more minutes. Oh, good. Okay, now yeah. um, uh, I have now reversed the question uh, about uh, what is created when Shar happens. And the reverse question would be, what must happen in order for something to be Shar? So let me look again to the, into the Rusal Dinur. we can see that, first of all, uh, Imam Nursi talks about deviation from Sirat al mustaqim um, And this is uh, described by him uh, in much more detail in the Isharat al ijaz when he is giving the tafsir of uh, the Surah Fatiha. Uh, there he describes uh, very nicely what Sirat al mustaqim means and what we have to understand from it. Um, so I will, I will not, uh, you know, talk about the Sirat al-Mustaqim uh, in, in much more detail. I would like to focus rather on the other two points, which is, um, uh, which is related to free will uh, and related to Anna in relation to Shar. Now, uh, inclination towards that, which is disliked by God, which is related to free will, uh, here, uh, as we have said before, when we talk about the quiddity of free will, we can see that free will has no external existence either, just like Shar. It appears when there's something to choose and it disappears thereafter. Um, also, Shar comes into apparent being as soon as we incline towards it or we choose it. At the very moment of choice only, outside of our inclination or on, outside of our choice, Shar is nowhere to be found. So this again, basically is a uh, pointer to the fact that Shar is non-existential, that it has no external existence in that sense. And then also when we talk about uh, free will, we can also say that Shar takes apparent being in whoever has fallen away from the good and continues its being there for as long as that state uh, in that being continues. So this again um, plays to the to the question or points to the question, you know, um, is evil or shar uh, unlimited uh, or absolute as we have asked before. And uh, this basically answers the question saying uh, it is not, it is limited and it will cease to exist when um, when 
it will it will it will exist as long as uh, human beings continue to choose uh, that which is disliked by God, basically, or mis misuses his free choice in that sense. Um, and then there is uh, the misuse of the ana, uh, which can become an encouragement to all sorts of ashrar. That's what Imam Nursi said. So um, the ana. Uh, when we look, look into the quiddity again of the Anna, which is quite interesting, uh, Nursi says that Anna has also no external existence and serves as a unit of measurement. So it is quite interesting how we can see here, you know, how Sher and free will and Anna have the same sort of quiddity, the same sort of essence, you know, they're all non-existential and they're all just serve as a unit of measurement for human beings um, to understand creation better. Um, Anna is the means, says Imam Nursi, Anna is the means by which we solve the riddle um, of divine and human existence. So this is why Anna has been given to us, right? Uh, it, is, it is the trust, the amana that is mentioned in uh, the Quran, uh, which nobody wanted to, or no one wanted, nothing, nothing wanted to take on, uh, but human beings have, uh, have uh, taken it on. And it is, and Nursi says that it is the Anna that is the trust that is mentioned in the Quran. And it solves as a riddle, uh, to solve the riddle of uh, divine and human existence. Now this is, the, this is the reason, this is the aim of why Anna has been given to us. And then he also says that this, um, uh, the, that, that uh, it has two faces, that the Anna has two faces. Yeah, so one of the faces looks towards good and existence and uh, is not active. And it uh, serves as a, uh, as a manai harfi, as an other indicative, basically. That means if the ana is used from, from you know, uh, from this perspective, then it is always a pointer to the creator and it will serve uh, for us, it will, it, will, it will help us to understand, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is meant by it is not active, uh, relates to, again, to the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everything uh, that is good is from Allah and everything that is bad is from you. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, not active means uh, that a man is not capable uh, to produce any good and good is from God alone. Um, the other phrase, the second phase of Anna looks towards evil and goes to non-existence. And it is, uh, it is active in that sense. And it is self-referential. That means it is looking at everything from the perspective of mana ismi, basically. Now, um, Using that Anna for a human being, using that Anna or, or making use of that Anna that has been given to human beings um, like uh, as, a, as a unit of measurement in order to be able to, um, uh, to draw limits between what I can do and what Allah can do and being to, uh, trying to understand the absolute with our finite, uh, finite mind and our finite understanding uh, and so on. Um, the, the, the ultimate goal, basically, what Nursi also says in the Risali Nur, the ultimate goal is a complete surrender, is the understanding to be able to understand that there is, in fact, um, nothing uh, at all that we can do with our own power, and uh, to accept uh, this reality and to completely surrender to, to our Creator, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but this is obviously made in steps. Uh, this is why the N is there. We start with small steps, but the, the absolute, the, the ultimate goal is the absolute surrender. Now, if human beings fail to acknowledge its true nature and surrender uh, that imaginary ownership, says Nursi, what, what that gives rise to, uh, you know, to shirk, to partners with God, to evil and misguidance, to arrogance, which ultimately becomes sen uh, be where, we, where human beings become the center of their own universe and they start believing that everything evolves around them only and uh, nothing else is important. 
basically. So when we look, uh, uh, you know, from this perspective here, we can also see that, um, you know, what must happen for something to be shared. Basically, it all boils down to uh, the actions or to the responsibility of us human beings. Because when we look into uh, the, the definitions of the Quran uh, about share, we can also see that these are all related to moral, you know, to moral, the moral aspect, the moral evil aspect. Uh, you know, when we were making the distinction from literature uh, in, natural, in evil about natural evils and moral evils, we can see that the Quran does not define any natural evils whatsoever as being shar, uh, but rather only uh, the moral evil aspect of it, which is completely related to human beings' responsible uh, way of acting in this world, basically, as a, um, as a intelligent uh, being with free will and so on. <clears throat> uh, so to conclude, we can say that uh, inclination towards that which is khair draws us closer to, the, to existence and to absolute goodness. And uh, the continued inclination becomes a habit and eventually uh, it takes, um, it, it becomes a habit basically. Uh, and a character trait. Inclination towards that which is share, on the other hand, becomes a receptacle of non-existence, uh, hence to share, and uh, such continued inclination becomes a habit and the soul takes on the qualities of non-being, which have been produced as a product of ill choice. Now, um, as a conclusion, what we can see, say basically is uh, that everything God creates is either good in and of itself, or according to its results. We are not capable in producing any good whatsoever. All good is from God alone. Power or ability to, uh, for share. The power lies in neglection and abstaining from action. And this shows us that we need to seek refuge by God from share. In other words, from making the wrong choices, from not being able to keep the amana entrusted to us and from failing to completely surrender to our creator. So yeah, that was it uh, from me uh, for today. Uh, and I'm open for discussions, inshallah. Thank you very much. We are uh, right on time. There are some questions uh, in the chat room. I would like to read them one by one. Um, Anybody on. else? I mean, if anyone who even wrote the question, if they, you want to asked uh, in person you're most welcome please just let me know uh, I think you know this uh, zoom has a feature that you uh, show your hand you raise your hand and I can see who wants to talk and ask question so then I can give you the floor uh, the first question came from uh, Colin Ojam I would like to read it it's uh, actually uh, some comments and also some additions later on so I brought them together, so I will read all of them. How does the Quran go about actually defining sharr? We enter conversations such as these with the presumption that we all have a shared definition of what sharr is. I suggest that our problem is that we have never been able to define sharr successfully. Thus, all discussions which emerge around it are by default lacking from the outset. Is Sharr a brute fact? Then I believe the next one is a comment. All creation is from Allah. Since Allah is all good and perfect to, to the degree of absoluteness, there can be no Sharr in his creative act. Therefore Sharr cannot be instantiated in external creation as a thing that is created, makhluk. Ashrar are maj'ul, probably we can translate this as performed, right? And not makhluk, not created. If according to Nursi, shar has no actual existence, wujud khariji, in other words, then it has not been created. And thus we have to, to, to re-examine his statement 
which says the creation of Sharr is not Sharr because there is no notion of Sharr being created. His statement needs to be recast in a different way. So what is your comment on these? Yes, I have, I have thought about these, um, uh, these uh, statements uh, in the Rizal Nur myself as well, because Nursi also somewhere else also talks about uh, the existence of minor share, for example. Uh, and um, so he talks about... Uh, so, yes, I think... So he, he talks about the, the existence of minor share, he talks about, as uh, Colin stated, about uh, you know the, the 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 creation of share is not share, so but I think um, or I have come to the understanding that um, what Nursi is trying to say actually is not that he is saying that that share has is being uh, created or that it has an external existence as such, but it's just I think it's just so difficult to talk about it without using uh, you know using these the, the correct words basically in order to make it understandable to 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 the listener or to the reader so i think that he definitely defines share as non-existential and as a unit of measurement and if you look into the quranic definitions of uh, what share is we can also see that these are mainly attributes really uh, and you know and they're they're non -ex non-existential they don't exist either so and also they are um not only non-existential, but they're also uh, transformable in a sense that, uh, you know, uh, attributes can be turned from bad into good, right? So they're also not, they, they don't stick, they're not stuck on us, basically. They are transformable into, into the better, into the good, basically. So um, therefore, I think that um, uh, from that perspective, I think that definitely uh, it has no external existence. Yes, if, um, uh, it's uh, uh, existence is dependent on the existent on creation itself, basically, or in a, in a, in other words, maybe on us, even as human beings, as intelligent human beings, and our choices. Yes. Uh, but as I said, when Nursi says, you know, when he knows he talks about the createdness of share, which he does not do very often, by the way, but he does it in some occasions. I think he does it to make himself, um, to be able to express himself uh, in a better way. I couldn't find any other uh, solution for that myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wonder if uh, I, I would like to ask this question to uh, Colin Hoja. Uh, at the end, remember you say uh, the, his statement should be recast into a different statement. If you were to recast it, how would you do it? How would you say, express it? Is he here? Is, is uh, he yes, here? sorry, I'm here. I was muted. I, I was just talking away and I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent, uh, excellent talk to Bonur. I think that you put across very well the notion that Shar is not created. It has no external existence. I think we've discussed before this problem with the statement, creation of Shar is not Shar. Because in certain parts of the Rasal e Nur, um, Ustad Nursi talks about non-existence, talks about things being created from nothing, and then he talks about things being created apparently from nothing. So on many occasions he actually recasts his own declarations, um, and of course it depends where it was in the Resaleh that we, we, we read certain statements. When was this in his career that he made this particular statement? Did he later go back on that? Did he later finesse it? Did he change it? Um, and I don't think there is an answer to this. Um, I think what he's trying to say is that clearly, Shar exists in some way. Its existence is not Shar. I think that's what he's trying to say. It's the wujud of Shar is not Shar. Rather than, uh, the thing is, it, he articulates it as the creation of Shar. And I think this is because this is a theological um, conceit from um, the Middle Ages. This is how it was cast, particular statement. 
I think he's just repeating that. He's replicating it. It is. It is related to the whole idea. Whole idea of when we look look into the free will discussion. You know, when we say, you know, imagine two people who are uh, putting a knife into a person's heart. Uh, one of them is is uh, doing it with the intention to kill that person, and the other one is doing it with the intention to, uh, you know, to uh, perform surgery to heal that person. So one of them is called murderer, the other one is called uh, a doctor, right? Yes. So even if yes. even if that person would die under the hands of those two people, um, one of them would be blamed and the other one wouldn't because his intention was pure. His intention was to save the life of that person. Now, if you look into that example, for example, we can see that um, what is share or the share aspect there is actually non-existential in that sense because it's just an intention. Well, I don't want to say just because it's it's a very big thing really, but it is, it is an intention, a bad intention that is behind there. Whereas uh, if you look into that which has been created, that is death, right? Yes, and yes. according to the, from the Islamic perspective, death is not shar. Yeah, I think you brought that across very well. Um, your conclusion that there is no so-called natural evil. I think we start out from the presumption. Yes. We know what evil is when we're talking about it. And I think we have to disclude certain things. And one of them is this so-called natural evil. And I think that you... You put that across very well. Um, I think there is absolutely no doubt that there is no such thing as natural evil. As you say, the rest of it really pertains to um, moral ethical issues. I think it is very much, very much directly connected and directly related with, even maybe solely related to uh, human being, human being and his uh, vice gerency, his uh, uh, responsibility uh, on earth as a uh, in as an intelligent uh, human being with free will i think you're right yes now uh, let me read the next uh, question hakan uh, is asking how could we understand know that evil is from yourself and good is from God. This is also a statement by Ustaz Nursi. Mm -hmm. It is, it is a, an ayah from the Quran, isn't it? That all, yes. um, all good is from Allah and all evil is from ourselves. Yes, yes. yes. So the question is how we can understand that? Yes. Well, it is, uh, it, it is actually quite simple to understand that because um, anything, uh, that we do, anything that we do, we don't do with our own power, isn't it? So everything that we do, uh, it is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing us uh, to be able to do it. So from that perspective, we are mediators um, of anything uh, good that comes out of our hands. Now, um, uh, looking at it from, from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, share though, or um, asking for the share again. There is, there is a um, an intentional uh, willingness, in a sense, uh, or mayelan uh, towards that which is which is disliked by God. Now, this is this is a discussion. You know, how can we know it? I mean, it's a discussion where scholars have also discussed on it a lot, where they have said, you know. Uh, which part of, of it is our responsibility, which part isn't, you know, is it the choice, is it the mayelan only, is it the whole idea of, you know, wanting to do something. Um, but Nursi, I think, is in, is in line with the uh, Ash'ari view on that, saying that it is uh, the mayelan only, so to, to, to mail towards, to incline towards that which is, which is not liked by Allah. And um, as soon as you, as you basically do that, um, willingly, though, which is which is very important there, you know, because um, those 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 who don't know, uh, you know, what is liked by God and what is disliked by God, those who have no knowledge about that whatsoever, um, I don't think that they are being taken into account anyway, you know. Um, so, a human being who is doing it willingly uh, out of his, you know. Uh, consciously, I think is responsible, and that evil that comes out of it is his own responsibility. If that makes sense. 
yes. Uh, uh, but it goes, it plays, into, it plays into the idea of, you know, um, if everything is in Allah's control, if everything, if everything is done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, how is it then that it is uh, me who is doing the evil, basically, right? But yes. that also goes a little bit into the question that we've said uh, earlier about, you know, how Nursi explains that about the, uh, the two uh, people who are um, putting a knife into somebody's heart, right? That example. Um, so one of them is a doctor, the other one is a murderer, but you can't call God the murderer because, um, you know, he is the one who is creating and he's creating death. Uh, he's merely creating death. Uh, he's not doing anything else. Um, the fact that you are uh, consciously having that inclination of killing a person um, what is what makes you a murderer, basically, or entitles you to be a murderer. Yeah. Uh, and then and that has and a question. Yeah. Are you finished? Should I? Read yes, no, that's okay. Okay. Uh, with regard to Mayalan in free will, he says uh, Mayalan in free will does not have an actual existence according to Nursi. Is it Anna which does not have actual existence or manifested creative acts which Anna becomes conscious of? I don't know if you are able to follow from the chat room. I brought it together, know, you know. I, I don't know how to open that chat room, to be honest. Uh, uh, now, oh, okay. Uh, I think you need to first uh, close your uh, share screen. Ah, then you okay. see chat, and then you click, then you can see. Now, there is bottom, you can see chat. Ah, okay, okay, now I can see it, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah then it will be easy for you. You can just follow, read, and try to answer each question. And uh, I will follow those who raise their hands if they want to ask questions, please. Uh, we have already one. After uh, answering Nejati, I will give turn to Mustafa Tuna. Mustafa Oja will uh, ask his question. Please go ahead. Uh, Okay, so it's in, in Nejati Hojam asked, right? If according yeah. to Ursi, Shar has no actual existence, uh, then it has not been created and thus we have to re-examine his statement which says the creation of share is not okay so that's we've got done that that, that was Colin um, uh, for solution, maybe it might be easy if I just ask it right away. Yes, yes, please. please. Okay, go ahead, please. More yes. efficient, I think. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, I have some uh, internet uh, problem, connection problem. Hopefully, I can make it. Uh, again, I, I think it's the question of whether Anna does have any existence or not is a very interesting question. But my understanding, Anna, um, what is really uh, is the, me the measurement there or doesn't have the actual existence? perhaps maybe it's not any itself or it's not conscious self. So consciousness does exist. It's not like we just, you know, we think that we have this sense of self. So the sense of self, we can say does exist, but what the any claim to possess, let's say when I speak, when I do some things, that what I claim that's come from any, perhaps that is not real. So what is not real in my understanding from any, is not the Anna itself. Anna is real, that Anna is, does have a wujud, but uh, what is associated with Anna in terms of the creative act of God, that is not real because that's just, a, um, that's just against a way um, that, that is, you know, that given to the Anna that we can understand in terms of Wahid Qiyasi. That's my understanding. I know because I used to think like you that when I read this part from Anna, that perhaps and it doesn't exist, but then it becomes a problem. Then, then you say, if, and it doesn't exist really, that means uh, what is self? How would you define yourself? So it's imaginary that you think when you say I am, when you say, you know, um, when you feel about your own but self you identity. Think, but do you think that when, when, you, when we talk about Anna, the human eye, 
uh, we're not we're, we're obviously not talking about uh, flesh and body and um, I mean we're not talking about you in the sense of flesh and body are we uh, when we talk about the human eye um, but we talk about the conscious self the conscious self because the conscious is an essential right so the conscious self uh, is conscious of something but whatever you're conscious of it let's say I'm conscious of talking right now I'm talking so and the consciousness of this talking is real but that's come from any but the uh, feeling that as if I am actually talking it's me that creating this act that's not really uh, that's how I understand I don't know that's I think it's worth to discuss so because otherwise it become a problem to say you, you know you, you thinks that your talking is not you you don't exist at all as let's say a conscious self it make us to be somehow uh, you know to be imaginary to be no i don't think know, i don't so. think i don't think that the whole concept of anna uh, as described by imam nursi should be confused with uh, with uh, the concept of uh, uh, where you say, you know, there is no existence whatsoever. The only thing that exists is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I, I think these are two different concepts. I, I don't think that Anna, when you talk about the human eye, uh, that you are, uh, you know, in a sense, in a sense, denying the exist the, your own existence by saying that. I, I don't think so, because as I said, we are not talking about existence, when we talk about Anna, we're not talking about existence in the sense of um, a created createdness that is manifesting the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, as a contingent being. Uh, we are talking about uh, the human eye, which is, as Nursi says, an imaginary line uh, that is draw that draws a, um, a distinction between uh, you as a human being and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just in order to be able to grasp him to be able to understand his absoluteness in a sense so, so but then even you, that even then, that but then you will say you will say that so the self that must say that. so when we're talking when we're talking about uh, the self about the inner when I talk about inner about my human eyeness in a sense yeah I'm not, I'm not saying that it is something that is existent. I'm rather say, I'm just, I'm, it's, it is merrily, it is merrily a tool that, sh that helps us to um, understand our creator and his absoluteness. In a sense that we slowly start first, maybe we start, as Nursi says, we start saying up to here is mine, from here onwards is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am able to, you know, uh, to do my own garden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the whole universe. I am able to lift this glass with my uh, own power. This is the only thing that I can do with my power. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power is absolute. So I, I, I am basically all the time with this human eye that I have with this inner, this imaginary kind of measure, unit of measurement. I am trying to relate in a sense. But the ultimate goal is not, uh, you know, to say, okay, I am existent as Anna, this is me and this is God. It's not, it's not an existential, uh, existential differentiation that is happening there. It is completely uh, uh, in, in, in the sense of, 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 of measuring in a sense, you know? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I want to just bring, uh, maybe Absolut Jam uh, well aware of this and as well, in Immanuel Kant, is discussion of really what bring the unity in terms of Kant, uh, in terms of self, that he, he actually argues, as you mentioned, he says that there is no real self, but we need to really have this unity of all this emotion, all the senses. That's unity. That for this one, we need to have something that doesn't really exist, but, but then we call it self. So for him, this, trans, this transcendental self is just a, a way to really put all this input together that you make sense of what we have it. So, and that's, that, that's his argument. But Husserl will argue that he'll say, no, self is real. Self does exist. Self is not the imaginary things to provide unity in our experience. It's actually like you have the eyes, you have the ears, you have also a self as part of your, uh, with, with the actual existence. So again, my understanding of Nusi, that's why I try to see whether it's really, that we can call it an, uh, that self indeed is such imaginary things that provide the unity in our experience, or provide the measurement, or self 
itself is real, but whatever you mention when you say, I hold it, this, I do this, whatever is associated with self, that is not the act of self that you mistakenly imagine or you feel actually, not even if it's you speaking, you doing, but that is not real because you are not doing, because it's not your power. It's not your, your act. Again, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's worth to, that's what I would mm -hmm. try to bring into discussion to see which one is real, which one is not. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that's, that's enough, perhaps. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Mustafa Ocam, please go ahead. We are waiting for your question now. Okay, inshallah. I, well, it, it's actually not a question. I had raised my hand uh, when you were discussing uh, Colin Ojan's question about uh, is half a share the creation of share, uh, share. And I also wrote in the chat, but perhaps it's worth uh, bringing up in the discussion too. Uh, I, I guess if we go back and remember that this is taking place in the context of the, uh, the Risale on Qadr, which Ustad Nursi from the get-go says this is about what should be attributed to God and what should be attributed to the human being and this is about the, the, the position that the human being needs to take before God. Uh, perhaps then we can understand that and, and do the recasting that Korno Jam suggested. When we say Hulk share, right, we have one word share and then share the is not share we have a second word share do these two words mean the same thing and i would suggest that they don't mean the same thing and uh, we can perhaps go and refer to nejat hojam's uh, earlier discussion here about the phenomena versus noumena that is what is in the mind versus what is in the extra mental reality right so i would say when ustad nursi says that in the the first share that he refers to, half a share, is the, the share in the phenomenal world. That is what he's addressing us, right? He's addressing us saying, what you understand to be share, what you conceptualize to be share, right, in the noumenal world is not share. So the first one, the phenomenal share, does not have extra mental uh, wujud, existence, because it is a concept in our minds, whereas the second share is the result of the choice of share, right? So it, it, is, the, it is something that results from a choice and that result in the noumenal world has existence. But in the noumenal world, which is the big picture, it is not share. So I don't know if that solves, uh, helps us solve the uh, problem. Um, I can. I have read here uh, in the comments uh, a very interesting uh, question from Nevzat Hojam. He says, what do you think about entropy? Positive action as a method of reduced demands, evil decreases as goodness increases. Like hot, cold, dark light, increase goodness as a method of fighting evil. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to, I tend to say, I mean, it's, it's a very good one, but I tend to say that um, since, uh, since share is directly related uh, from the Quranic perspective to moral evils and is directly related to human beings' actions, I would, I would tend to say that as, as long as human beings exist, a share will always exist. <laughs> so we won't be able to, to completely get rid of it. Um, but it is certainly uh, uh, a way of, uh, you know, a, a way forward, if you want to say, to say, you know, if, if we can raise consciousness in human beings uh, to, to, do the, to do the right thing, in a sense, uh, that, that might certainly, uh, you know, decrease the amount of share that is in the world. You know, uh, and that that is only because that is only uh, because um, uh, because of the fact that a share in the Quran is related directly to human beings' actions rather than you know and it's not about natural disasters and natural uh, you know natural events that are happening. Uh, therefore, it might be controllable in a sense. It might be uh, we might be able to steer its direction into uh, towards that which is good, basically with obviously with the help of Allah because you know we have to always seek refuge in him from all sorts of uh, share 
uh, nevertheless. Yeah, Paris Hoja has a question. I would like to formulate it. Does it mean that as wujud khair is there, it has external existence? But for any reason, if khair is lacking or does not exist, then it is sharr. So would you like to say anything on this? Uh, I mean, uh, khair, khair is directly related to wujud. And khair, uh, and wujud is khair al-mahs. So anything that is khair definitely uh, has wujud. Uh, there, I think there is no doubt about it. And um, again, related to human beings, you know, anything that lacks uh, that uh, cause or that, that lacks uh, goodness, um, you know, goes into non-existence and, and ceases to exist in a way or fails to come into existence even. Yes, uh, Sister Nadina has a question. I would like to read it now. Doesn't Ayah 216 from Surah Al-Baqarah identify Sharr as an existential thing? So this, uh, this is the verse. Perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you. And perhaps you love a thing and it is bad, namely Sharr for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Yes. <clears throat> well, um, here again, I think um, what the what the Quran is referring to is um, has more to do with our desires and the things that we desire as human beings. Uh, and it also boils down again to you know our own choices uh, that we make. Uh, it is, you know, the things that we believe are good for us and the things that we, uh, you know, uh, believe are higher for us. This is what we always desire for. That is what we always ask maybe from Allah uh, to, to give us. Uh, but uh, then in the, in the ayah it says, you, know, you love a thing and it is not good for you in the sense of, for example, when I say, when I pray to Allah all the time because of my desire, and I say, Allah, give me, uh, give me a son, give me a son, give me a son, give me a son, yeah? And then ultimately, Allah give me, gives me that son, and then I start um, going into shirk with that son. I'm so attached to that son that I completely forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that sense, when that ayah talk about, talks about share, it does not talk about, I don't think it talks about existential share. It talks about the outcome thereof that will happen in my, again, in, in me choosing the wrong thing, basically. In me maybe um, going the wrong path, down the wrong path, in a sense. So, you know, I think that's what that ayah relates to rather than, rather than you know, the existentiality of it. Okay, uh, Ahmed Hoja takes us to another ground, I think, and, and this is a really a very interesting question. Uh, also very important. What are the theological and political, if any, implications of this discussion concerning the nature of Sharr? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, this, this, is, this is very good. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, the theological implication really is, to my understanding, is a complete surrender, you know, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, you know, ultimately. Uh, because uh, as I have come, I have to my, for myself, I have come to the uh, to this, uh, conclusion, in a sense, that... Um, Nothing that is good is from us, but also anything that is shar, we have, we have to seek refuge uh, from Allah, uh, you know, in order for not to go, to go down that path, basically. So in that, if you look at it from that perspective, it is, ever, it is really, you know, complete surrender, really. Um, so from a complete theological perspective, I would say, when we talk about the nature of shar, it is completely down to the discussion of the uh, vicegerency and of the uh, responsibility of human beings 
on earth. So I think what needs to be, what we need to concentrate on when we have those theological discussions is very much on, you know, the questions, the existential questions of, you know, uh, human beings knowing themselves and knowing about their responsibilities, knowing about why they're here, you know, the existential questions, where they have come from, why they're here and where they're going to, and then their relationship with their Lord, how that relationship can be, can be built. And also uh, trying to find, trying to know, you know, themselves versus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how that relationship works. I think the, the main concentration of theology should definitely be uh, on that on, and on the responsibility of human beings uh, in this world. Now, when you look at it from a political aspect, I am definitely not a politician, so um, I would rather abstain from answering that question. But if you, if, you, if you see what I mean when I talk about it, about the responsibility of human beings from a theological perspective, that can be related to politics as well, I think. <laughs> Yes, uh, Dr. Tubanur, there is a very loud azan here. You so please you continue from Yunus Hoja's question. I will close my microphone. So, what is Yunus Hoja asking? What is existence? Is there a precise definition for it? <laughs> Yunus Hoja, this is your area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I get confused about existence, you know, <laughs> so I need some clarification. <clears throat> to my understanding, existence is anything that is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and comes into the alam shahada. This is what I understand from existence. Uh, but then in the, on the other hand, uh, we have said that there is no, uh, no uh, absolute non-existence either. So we have said that everything exists in one form or another. So um, there is the existence from the perspective of what we can see, what is tangible, what we can touch, you know, what, with our five senses. And then there is also the existence that is existent in uh, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we cannot see. And then of course there is also existence of uh, alam, uh, you know, that again, we are not able to see. So there is a lot of existences, I think, rather than just one existence. But I am, but this is, this is how far my smartness goes. I am most of the time not even able to answer the questions my kids ask asks me. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> So, and then... Uh, Dr. Nasreen, next, uh, her question. I see Nijati's hand is up, but please wait, your turn will come. Perhaps this goes back to how we understand Allah. There is a difference when we say Allah creates versus Allah manifests. Uh, yes, would you like to, would you like to uh, elaborate on that a little bit, Sister Nasreen? Um, thank you very much, Chumvaru, for, for your great presentation. Uh, great to see everyone here from New York. Um, no, just, just, a, uh, just a very brief comment about when we talk about existence, you know, wajibul wujub, and then mumkinul wujud, as far as the philosophy of, um, you know, the philosophical perspective, I would say, of uh, the Muslim scholars are concerned. And there is a huge discussion, as you know, between um, you know, our understanding or everyone's understanding as far as Allah or God is concerned, you know, it's a huge difference when we say God uh, creates and therefore the creation of shar and khayr comes under that umbrella versus when we say Allah manifests. And that's why when you refer to Wahdat um, al-Wujub, a uh, theory of the Urafa or the Sufi understanding goes back to that. So that um, manifestation then uh, becomes the whole focus of, uh, of Allah and our creation and our existence, not necessarily that something gets created, right? So um, it, it sort of puts another layer, if you would, or sheds some light perhaps on um, the understanding of shar and khair. It was just a comment just to mm -hmm. provoke, provoke some thinking uh, mm -hmm. perhaps around that topic. 
Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now I think uh, Dr. Nejat, you can go on to, if you have comment or want to ask your question, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for second time. So, uh, again, in my understanding that the way you defined uh, share is based on CASP, which is making choice. Um, then so when you choose again um, that you mix a share. So, uh, and can we say that whatever happened in our life, it is either it's our choice, if it's, if it's not our choice, it's ultimately God's choice for us. Because without his approval, without his choice, nothing can happen to us. So if it is in this regard, that even though let's say an evil doer will choose to harm us, but God, if God does not allow, it's not going. It's not going to actually um, happen to us. So in that case, um, can we say that um, actually evil is only when you um, choose to uh, make a cast and harm? Then in this case, your choice, you harming your staff, which means that there is no evil for you because God is ultimate protector of you from all evils, unless you choose to make uh, whatever happened to you to be evil. So let's say if someone harmed you, some, something happened to you. So as long as if you, uh, in this case, if the, uh, you know, a person make an unjust choice and harm you, that's actually a person is harming himself or herself. From your side, your, all of your right is protected. Because let's say even if you get killed, you're gonna be shaheed. So in, there is no loss for you. You are under full divine insurance or divine protection. So can we look in this way and say, you know, as a, as a share is only um, that when you, it's, you know, it, it's only happen when you choose to make for yourself, but for others, um, there is no share because they are under divine protection and whatever you try to do for them eventually God's will turn this into a higher for them because it doesn't allow that. What do you think on this? Uh, correctly, if I understand your question correctly, what you're saying is, for example, let's, let's put it on an example. I have a gun in my hand and I have the intention of killing uh, Alpha Islam <laughs> And uh, so uh, for, for me to have the intention of killing him uh, is my evil intention, obviously. I am consciously choosing to harm him, right? And then uh, on the other hand, him being harmed by me, uh, you're looking, I think you're looking at, at it from, from two perspectives, right? So al Parsan Hajam being harmed uh, through me, is that evil for him as well? Is that what you're asking? Exactly, so in a sense that um, if you really look at it for him, it is a great reward actually because he's going to get Mertaba uh, Shahada. Uh, so for him, there is no, no evil, nothing bad. It's only bad for you because you made a bad choice. So in this case, that he is always under divine protection. So there is no, there is no harm to anyone because everyone, for everything, if it's not their choice, they are under the divine mercy and divine protection. Yes, yes. Um, so um, from, when we look into into uh, you know the definitions uh, that have been given, it is correct what you're saying. Uh, so when the my intention of killing Al Parsan Hojam is that is what is evil, the intention of me consciously want, wanting to harm him basically. From his perspective, it is a calamity. It is a uh, musiba in a sense, if you want to say so. Uh, and if his life ends, as you said, there, is, there might be even a reward. So from his perspective, uh, he would not be able to say, oh, evil has, has happened to me. Because uh, what has happened to him is death, which is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is not evil. Uh, because it is the creation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from that perspective, Al-Parslan Hojam would not be able to say evil has, um, has happened to me. But um, the very fact that I have had that inclination of harming someone, that's the, the part that is evil, that is defined as evil, which has no external existence. 
and which is not created really, you know, it has no creative power. It is just the, my ignorance, which is a lack of knowledge. Okay, uh, I think uh, Mustafa Hujam has uh, either a comment or another question. I can see his hand, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Assalamu alaikum again. Uh, again, this will go back to an earlier discussion about what existence is. Uh, and I was thinking as, as the conversation was going on, I was thinking once we make a distinction between necessarily existent, existent being and contingent beings, and, and we, once we start talking about contingent beings, uh, one way I have read or heard, I can't remember now, that being explained is that the, the word existence, wujud, obviously goes to the, the verb wajada, which means to find. So wujud is that, that which is uh, capable of being found, mm -hmm. right? Then the difference uh, or the distinction between Adam and wujud would be between uh, being hidden and being uh, manifest, right? And that we can connect to the uh, Hadith Qudsi about I was a hidden treasure, I wanted to be known, right? Uh, and then again, related to it, uh, Ibn al-Arabi talks about Adam and then Adam al-Adam. And I have heard this being explained as Adam al-Adam, meaning that things are not manifest, but they, they still exist in God's knowledge, right? So the, God's knowledge is eternal, and he knows all that comes into existence that we can find and all that we cannot find because he did not manifest it. He knows all possibilities and he chooses one among those possibilities to, to uh, manifest. Uh, so when we think in this context, we can understand non-existence as that which cannot be found because it's in God's knowledge and he did not manifest it and we can understand existence as that God has manifested. Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair, yeah, that's very, very good, mashallah. Thank you. I'm wondering if you are able to follow the questions. There is uh, one, uh, Brother Gökmen is uh, asking, Another uh, question. Let me see if I I can find it. Was up uh, first question was related to Anna, but I think uh, I agree with uh, Colin Hojam that you know let's leave Anna for another time right now. It uh, is the whole but, topic all in itself, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a totally different uh, topic. Uh, let me see. But the second one desire manifestation of love in this world so uh, this uh, question as far as you understand whatever you understand that, you that question has been uh, asked by my husband to everyone <laughs> oh okay <laughs> very good <laughs> so in in that case we have uh, just one question left that is faris to just question probably trying to bring no, I, the this I think you should you should still you should still try to look into that question because he's asked me that question myself as, as well and I said why don't you ask it to everyone <laughs> oh okay it's then the floor is open for everybody if they want to reply to that but let me uh, finish uh, Paris which has a question uh, can you say a few words about Khair Shar Bela Musiba and the relationship between all of these uh, concepts. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I wonder if he wants to bring the discussion to what is going on today, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm not sure whether he's asking the question from an ontological perspective of, or generally speaking. Um, but when we talk about Bela, Musiba, uh, and um, and uh, any such, you know, uh, alike, uh, the like of it. I think this is more related to uh, the receiver, the receiver, uh, you know, of uh, of those things, you know, of shar, if if you want to say so, maybe. Uh, when when we look at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, uh, moral evil, obviously. <clears throat> 
So uh, as I said before in the example, so when I, uh, when I decide to harm uh, Alparslan Hojam, uh, he's the receiver of that harm. And for him, it is a bela, it is a musiba, what is happening. Uh, from, from my perspective, however, uh, it is uh, a, 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 a mal, mal intention. It is uh, an evil, uh, you know, as, as per definition, uh, in a sense, or share as per definition. Now, um, uh, so, so any any bala musiba I think is related, therefore, to natural evils as well. As uh, as from the from the perspective of natural evils, I would say that anyone who is afflicted by natural evils, for him that is a bala, that is a musiba, uh, and also from a the perspective of moral evil, anyone who is the receiver of that is again. Uh, goes again under the category of uh, musiba and bela. Uh, whereas when we talk about shar, for example, as I said before, that is uh, the uh, not the receiver perspective, but the perspective of uh, uh, of the person who is inflicting it, basically on on the other. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, but yeah, I think uh, Sister Mashid and uh, and Nasrin, Sister Nasrin would be able to uh, give a much better explanation to Bela and Musiba in that sense. See, she's already yeah. corrected me. She says, Bela does not mean calamity, Musiba. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, they have studied the whole idea of Bela and Musiba. I think they would be able to give a much better explanation as to what the differences of those are as well. Uh, okay. So if I may, I would just, I would just say very, um, very quickly, just like two sentences, is that according to the Quran, uh, bala basically means uh, any kind of um, challenge or test, but it does not, unfortunately, in the um, in the popular understanding, and sometimes even in the scholarly work, bala is referred to as um, like musiba or calamity or anything that is negative. So it's, it's presented as uh, a negative connotation. Um, but according to the Quran, and inshallah, um, when it's my turn to speak on this topic, I will uh, shed more light on it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, calamity or musiba. It basically means any situation and that um, human beings is being tested on. So whether it's prosperity, uh, whether it's, so it is actually a test in good and bad, right? So it could be in share or it could be uh, in good in wealth, in, in health, that um, we, we might be tested. And again, um, I don't want to take your time now here, but just to have answered that question very, very briefly. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't uh, been seen. Uh, Dr. Farid's hand has been uh, up uh, for so long. I have concentrated on the questions to read, so I missed it. Please go ahead, Dr. Farid. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, just a couple of uh, questions. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks very much for your wonderful presentation. I, it, it's a very difficult topic, um, and you know, I, I admire you for that. Um, I just have uh, two uh, questions. One is about this whole issue of natural evils. Um, um, and you talked about natural versus moral evils, but I'm I'm just wondering whether in um, well, first of all, the whole issue of whether there is such a distinction, um, because um, what is often said to be natural, uh, you know, like a natural disaster, actually has human causes. Uh, for example, COVID-19, um, um, it has something to do with the way human beings we're not saying that you know the virus was manufactured but um the, the 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 fact that humans have gone beyond uh, certain boundaries consuming certain kinds of uh, you know uh, uh, animals um <clears throat> and you know reduce the um uh, the 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 um uh, the, the distinction um uh, between humans and animals has brought the virus into us uh, the idea that certain um, kinds of, uh, you know, so-called natural disasters are actually due to human conduct, uh, earthquakes, for example. Um, so that, that distinction may not be so um, useful. But 
um, more importantly, I'm just wondering that in Islamic tradition, um, perhaps we don't make this distinction between natural uh, and human uh, because nature is a universal. It is something that, at least in Islamic tradition, something that we say of all material as well as um, physical uh, things, in, um, material, physical, as well as spiritual beings are natural in that sense, right? So in, that's what I mean by saying that nature mm -hmm. is, is a universal. So um, if that is the case, so the first question is, how do you typologize evil? Because in the, in the Christian tradition, of course, there is, and in the modern tradition, there is this distinction between natural and moral and metaphysical evil, right? But if we don't accept that distinction between nature and non-nature, then how, what kind of typology of evil would we have? Um, so that's the first question. The, the second question what do um, you has mean, to do... What, what do you mean by uh, how, how do I differentiate by, uh, amongst the different types of, of, of evil then? That's what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, from an Islamic perspective, what would be the types, you know, like in, 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 well, as, in modern... As far as I can see, to be honest, from the Quranic perspective, there, there is no type, uh, ty typification really of, of a share in that sense. There is only one sort. In a well, sense. I know, but then you, you, you yourself have been, um, and many of us have been talking about natural evil versus moral evil. Mm -hmm. um, but if that, if that the nature non-nature distinction doesn't work mm -hmm. in our tradition then is it correct to then speak of nature natural versus yeah, moral no, that's, yeah yeah evil. Uh, yeah maybe, so, maybe i should have yeah. made that clearer because in the presentation i was saying that um when you look into literature this is what is being used there is this distinction between natural evils and moral evils this is what you come across always when you look into literature about and read about evil uh, the problem of evil in general. This is the first thing that you will come across. The distinction of the type, you know, typology between the natural evils and moral evils in, in a very broad sense when you talk about it. This is the main two uh, distinctions, basically. But um, yeah. that's why I, for example, also in my work, I have never used uh, the, the word evil when I was talking about Sharr, because the, it's, I think it's not the same thing. Uh, I mean, not the same thing in a sense of the uh, the perceived per past in, in common literature when we talk about evil is not the same as the perception of shar from an Islamic perspective. Therefore, I have used uh, shar as a word in the original and have not used uh, evil instead of it uh, from, you know, the English translation for it, uh, if you want to say so, because I didn't want to get those two mixed up. I mean, the use of terminologies is, is another, it's another yeah. question. I mean, we could argue about whether, I mean, I yeah. think it's fine to use evil as long as it's understood in terms of shar. Because um, otherwise, if we, if we go along, if we go down that uh, road, we can't use any word in English. I mean, we can't use religion for deen. We can't use, you know, any word in English. So I think the issue more is how we understand those terms, whatever language we speak in, um, whatever, we, whatever word we use for, 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 for Shar in English or Persian or, or Turkish or Malay, it should be understood in, in terms of the concept of Shar and not in terms of a Christian concept of evil or something. But that's, you know, your point is, is well taken. But the issue is, I guess, is there such a thing as natural evil? If everything is natural, if nature is a universal yeah. and can be said of all things, is, can we speak of natural um, um, evil? Uh, uh, isn't, isn't all evil natural, in other words? Anyway, that was my first question. Um, my second question has to do with the social and political uh, implications of, uh, of Shar. Um, now, humans can, of course, choose between good and, and evil. Um, now, it seems to me that if we are going to discuss a particular theory of evil or a particular understanding of evil, in this case, Ustad Nursi's understanding of evil. Um, and, and if we assume that there are different understandings of evil, um, I assume there are, there are different understandings of evil among the Muslim scholars. Otherwise, we won't be speaking of Nursi's understanding of, of evil. Um, the question is, what are the implications of our understanding of evil from Nursi's perspective for um, our lives, 
our social lives, our political lives, our our economic lives. And and let me say that one doesn't have to be a politician to answer that question because we're not talking about um, you know uh, about politics. We're talking about the the um, the evil that we find in our world. Um, uh, it has to do with relations between human beings and. Um, it is relevant to all of us unless you happen to be a human being who is in Khalwat, you know, who lives in isolation from every other human being. And then maybe this, um, you may only be concerned with evil at the metaphysical uh, level. Uh, but as long as we live with other human beings, the, the question of the implications of our understanding of evil is, is important. So is it important? I guess my question is, is it necessary for us to understand evil at this level um, and to distinguish between you know, Nursi's perspective and other theological perspectives on evil, is all that necessary in order for us to take a particular position in our social and economic and political lives, in our interaction with other human beings? Uh, is that necessary? Yeah. Um. Uh, thank you very much for that question. I will, uh, I will uh, start with the second question that you have raised. And I think that it is very, very important, in fact, um, as, because um, the whole idea of, uh, you know, the, the quiddity of share where, or the, the source of share and where, where share comes from and um, is very much related, as I said before, to uh, the responsibility of uh, and the vicegerency of human beings. Um, in in this world, so uh, if you, if you really look at it from this perspective, that that um, the very source of share is uh, the uh, the decisions that human beings make on a day to day basis, basically, you know, be it be it political, be it social, be it uh, you know, in in all areas of life, really, then uh, we can say that it is very um, paramount that um, we. Um, uh, we are making the right decisions, basically, and making the right decisions is also very much uh, connected to um, getting rid of that uh, that ignorance that many people face nowadays. And um, it is it is uh, the the idea of that uh, is very much in the forefront at the moment. It is the idea of you know materialism. It is the idea of you know human beings being in the center of uh, of the universe, you know, as Nursi says, you know, as long as I am fine, uh, what does it matter what everyone else, the state of everyone else is in? Uh, and he, he's touching on, on those, on those uh, social, uh, you know, problems and those, those social issues on, on, on many levels within the Risali Nur. And I think that is all uh, comes down or boils down or is related to uh, the, the concept of share, uh, especially from, uh, you know, how it is defined uh, in the Quran. Um, as those attributes, you know, as as falling away from, uh, you know, being falling away from or being um, how I how did I did I describe it before, um, the distorted relationship with uh, with God, uh, which is which is which is exactly that, you know, um, a distorted relationship with God that is what causes evil um, uh, in human beings. So um, I, I don't uh, know if I'm if I'm trying if if I'm answering your question correctly or if I'm if I'm uh, being in the on the right track here, but I think that it is paramount to establish the idea of uh, you know the source of share where share comes from you know what what its quiddity is and um, uh, from and I think from you know the and I think that the um, uh, that Imam Nursi's perspective on share is uh, not very different, is not very much, you know, very, very different from uh, the other scholars before him who have talked about share. Uh, Imam Ghazali, for example, um, has said very similar things to what Nursi says. However, he's just uh, maybe put it more bluntly, uh, you know, in, in more, more, more uh, sharply, basically, whereas Nursi has tried to um, make it more accessible to a wider public, basically. Uh, but if you look at it, um, you know what other scholars have said before Nursi. It's it's not it's not uh, completely different. I don't. I haven't. I haven't come across, for example, any Muslim scholar who has defined um, 
you know, I will say again, natural evil, you know, as, uh, as share in the sense of how it has been described in the Quran, for example. So, um, so I think the, 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 the scholars actually are in line with their definition of what share is, uh, in a sense. And, uh, and I think that that concept should be taken uh, very much into um, all aspects of life, really, uh, and try to be implemented uh, as, you know, being a Quranic definition uh, of shar. Really. I don't know if that answers a little bit the question that you've been asking. Um, yeah, it, it does. Um, it, it just, um, you know, raises for me the question of um, what then do we mean by, by Nursi's perspective? Um, because you know, the, when you say oh, perspective, yeah, I, I understand what you mean you, a certain yes, point yes. of view, right? Yes. So it, it's it's either if it's in line with the, the yes. tradition. Well, Nursi, is, Nursi, I think uh, in, in, Nursi has has added to that discourse. What Nursi has added, to, or what might make you Nursi uh, unique in that sense uh, in his discussion of Shar, uh, is first of all that he talks uh, about Shar from the perspective of divine names and attributes. Uh, very much so, um, which also Matt Rudy has a little bit done with uh, his uh, understanding of hikmah and going down the, the hikmah road, or the wisdom road, you know, when he was talking about, uh, when he was justifying the, the existence of evil. But then also that he has defined, uh, made those definitions of um, shar and free will and ana being um, non-existential in nature and having... Um, um, uh, having our uh, being serving as, as as unit of measurements, for example, which relates those those topics very closely to each other and makes it easier to understand that. Okay, so when we talk about share and you talk about free will, share has no external existence; it is a unit of measurement. Oh, okay, so when we talk about free will, free will has no existence, uh, external existence, and is a unit of measurement. So now we talk about Anna. Anna has no ex external existence and is a unit of measurement. So when we to and, and when you look into Anna and Nurse's description of Anna, you can see that, okay, the second phase of Anna talks about how it can be prone to all sorts of evils and all sorts of, you know, when it is misused. And so he talks about free will and he says, when it is misused, it will be prone to all sorts of evils. And then you look into the definition of evil itself and you see, oh, okay, so evil is that are by definition of the Quran. So, and when you then, you are, then you have the possibility to link all of these with, the, with each other. You know, it is like a threat that goes from one to the other. And I think Nursi has done a very good job in basically, um, uh, uh, linking, you know, those those different ideas uh, with each other, and basically, basically giving you a path, you know, from one to the uh, to, to the through the other to the other, uh, showing you that this is, you know, and he's made it very tangible and very existential in a sense in in our lives, where we can say, okay, so this is this is, because this is a very very theoretical concept. It is a very abstract concept if you look at it from that perspective. But if you go down and you go into these definitions and you go into free will and Anna and you can look into it that way, how Nursi is basically paving that way for us, then it becomes much more tangible and you can say, okay, so in my life, in the way that I live, you know, this is how I can abstain from it. And this is what I need to do in order to be on the on the right path on the surat mustaqim and this is what i need to do to be able to 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 refrain from what what it is that allah dislikes basically and then i will be safe from share in a sense yeah thank you thank you that's that's very helpful thanks i think this question concerning the political and social implications of this issue we need to think uh, more about it. I never thought about it really. I'm just uh, speculating, trying to say, to think if uh, I can also come up with any answer to this or not. But maybe we should leave this for another discussion also, inshallah. I think so. I think also it's very interesting. And I think actually it deserves another book, to be honest. <laughs> yes. Not to look at the, to look at the uh, as you said, at the implications of Shar. Uh, from a social and political aspect, it is. It can be another book, you know. It's really, yeah. Yes. Okay. I think uh, all the questions are finished. I don't know if anybody else wants to make any comments. I, as far as I can see, I don't see 
any more hands raised up. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tubanur. It was, a, as uh, uh, Khalil Hojam said, it was a very good uh, discussion, uh, which leads us to another discussion, inshallah, for the next uh, uh, webinar seminar. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Nasrin Ruzati. She will be giving her talk also on the same issue, but perhaps more general evil in Islamic thought on July 19th, inshallah, on Sunday. And then we are planning to stop, uh, to give a summer break, and then restart, inshallah, our webinars, uh, maybe about mid-September or so. So thank you very much for everybody again, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tuba Nur, thank you for this nice for presentation. You. So we'll see you all, inshallah, in our next webinar. Assalamu alaikum. Ma salam, salam alaikum everyone.